kayaks took part in this event. They kept going along the shoreline until sundown and the rising of the moon. It's, it's probably a little chilly. It's, well, it's even in the Keys. Though. Oh, I don't know. Oh, uh, yeah, probably not. It's kind of cool, though. <laughs> it is cool. It's a good excuse to do an all nighter. <laughs> So you're still jet lagged, right? Oh yeah, yeah. I'm about to fall asleep at any moment. Yeah, I wish I was kayaking right now. Keep me, keep me a little more awake. But we're we're doing okay. It's good to have you back. Yeah, it's great glad, to be back. Glad you had a great honeymoon. Yeah. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope to see you back here again tomorrow. News three now at five starts right now. And what Jamie Kloss's guardian is saying about her life nearly one year after she was abducted. Plus, Sun Prairie is doubling the number of polling places for upcoming elections. Why a clerk says the additions are much needed. From the Channel3000.com Alert Center, this is News 3 Now at 5. And thanks for staying with us. Sun Prairie is doubling up on its polling places. Last November, people were waiting in line for up to two hours to vote. But the city says what happened last year was just unacceptable. Jamie Perez shares how big of a need we're talking about here and how much this is costing the city. Jamie? Yeah, well, Sun Prairie is probably one of the fastest growing cities in the state. And they want to be able to keep up with the demand that they're seeing at their polling places. They say this year they knew they had to do something after being overwhelmed by the uptick of people registering to vote vote this year. Voting is one of our constitutional rights, but last year some people in Sun Prairie walked away from that when they saw how long the lines were to vote. They were overwhelmed with devout um, voters, uh, people who were struggling with, you know, small children that were not happy about waiting there for such a long time. Um, and, you know, I can only imagine how many people may have walked away and just said, I don't have time to do this. This year, Sun Prairie is doubling up on polling places, increasing from four locations to eight. They were seeing about 4,400 people at each location last year, but with the increase in polling places. We'll be feeding about 2,000 people through each of our polling locations. That number could vary based on the increase in voters they saw within the last couple of weeks, especially on National Voter Registration Day. Every time somebody registers there, we get an email that just says, hey, you've got a new person. And so we were noticing on that day that it's just every couple minutes there was a new registrant, new registrant. Last year, people were waiting from 45 minutes to two hours at some locations. Voted at the polls, election day registrations, voter turnout for that particular ward, and so we've got it for all 27 wards. The hope is that time will be cut by more than half. I believe the federal goal is no longer than a 30-minute wait, and we'd still like to be well under that. We now, this is the cost costing the city between $16,000 and $25,000 per additional polling location to stock them all with proper voting equipment. But they say it is worth it if it means that everyone will get the chance to vote who wants to. All right, Jamie Perez reporting for us tonight. Thank you, Jamie. Sure. More local news now. The woman charged with shooting and killing a man in Sauk County and leaving behind his body is in jail on half a million dollar signature bond this afternoon. Amber Lundgren was visibly emotional when appearing via video this afternoon. She's charged with first degree intentional homicide after the state says Lundgren shot Christopher Little twice in the back of the head and the neck two and a half weeks before police found his body. According to the prosecution today, surveillance video showed Lundgren getting into the victim's car the night he was killed. The defense argues Little attacked Lundgren and that she acted in self-defense. However, a criminal complaint says she left the body, hid the gun, and threw out bullet casings used as at the shooting. Lundgren will be back in court again next week. Let's get a look at first alert weather now. It's chilly, but hey, at least the sun was out there to start the work week. Meteorologist Chris Reese joining us on the weather patio. Chris? Yeah, that's right, Eric. We'd certainly needed that sunshine today to just kind of change the mood after a couple of great days out there, but it is indeed still chilly. Temperatures made it, though, into the low 50s today, so that's certainly some good news. Plenty of sunshine out there right now. The temperature's still at 51 with a calm wind. The dew points into the low 30s right now, but those clouds are one of the things that are going to be on the increase. A lot of us made it into the 50s, though. Janesville, 54. Same for our friends over in Boscobel. Lacrosse at 53. Viroqua at 49. Here's weather track showing you that the only thing we had to track was a few rounds of decorator cloud cover going throughout the day. Blue sky truly did dominate things, but as we move into the overnight hours, I think the cloud cover is going to be on the increase. We'll also see some developing showers. Temperatures will fall down into the upper 30s. 
and then the rain chances are on the way as we head into tomorrow. But we're timing that out along with perhaps some additional rain chances through the week coming up in Maine weather. All right, thank you so much, Chris. Around the state, maybe hard to believe, but tomorrow marks one year since Jamie Kloss was abducted by Jake Patterson after he forced his way inside her home and killed her father and mother. The Barron County Sheriff's Department held a news conference this morning ahead of that anniversary. Sheriff Chris Fitzgerald honored each of the 10 lead agents who worked on Kloss's case. Kloss's guardian, Chris Gramstrup, says she had a busy summer with her aunts and friends hiking through state parks. Last, I want to thank Jamie. She's opened her heart in a way and given me and many other people around her a real sense of trust. I appreciate that. I told her, uh, Jamie, many months ago, I said that uh, you were stuck with me for the rest of your life. That was my way of saying that I'm always going to be there for you. The now 14 year old Kloss was held in captivity in Gordon, Wisconsin for 88 days until she escaped in January. Jake Patterson was sentenced to two consecutive life sentences in prison, plus an additional 40 years. This morning in a radio interview, Wisconsin Senator Ron Johnson said Democrats, quote, loathe President Trump and have been waiting to sabotage his president since the day after the election. Senator Johnson says Democrats are trying to do, quote, everything they can to bring him down amid the House impeachment inquiry. Democratic State Representatives Mark Pocan and Gwen Moore have been vocally in support of the impeachment inquiry. Five teens are in custody after reportedly running away from the scene of an SUV crash on Piedmont Road Friday afternoon. Officials say a resident there heard a crash about 4.30, saw an SUV hit the curb when he approached the teens. They took off. Police say the man then chased after them when he realized the car was likely stolen. The three of the teens started swinging at him. The man called police, tracked down the teens, finding them on Canterbury Road. Uh, officials say several of the teens arrested called out the name of a street gang connected to a series of recent car thefts. The search to find Madison's next police chief starts tonight. The city's police and fire commission will begin those talks at their meeting starting in just about half an hour. And that is where we find Madeline O'Neill with details on what will happen tonight. Maddie. This is the first time the search for a new chief is on the agenda since Chief Mike Koval announced his retirement a few weeks ago. Now, currently, Assistant Chief Vic Wall is serving as acting chief. Tonight, the PFC board, made up of five citizen volunteers appointed by the city, will likely make the official decision on who will be acting chief during their search for a permanent replacement. A PFC representative tells me they're looking at the three assistant chiefs under Koval, including Wall, but the other two assistant chiefs chiefs have told the board they don't wish to be considered. We will hear from Wall, the likely candidate tonight at the meeting. The next step for the board will be to begin their search for a permanent chief, a position Wall has said he's not interested in. Now that process can take up to a year as they search for a chief that meets the qualifications. We'll have more on what those qualifications are as long as well as an update on what happens at the meeting tonight at 10. Certainly a process we will continue to cover. Madeline O'Neill reporting live from downtown Madison. Thanks, Maddie. UW Police Chief Kristen Roman is issuing an apology today for a tweet that sparked a negative response on Saturday. Chief Roman's tweet showed a photo of a group of officers standing at the top of Bascom Hill wearing sunglasses with their arms crossed. It was captioned, quote, it's Saturday and you know what that means. Let's do this. Hashtag game day again. In her statement, Chief Roman says she understood that some people received the post negatively and that she is, quote, all too familiar with the strained trust communities of color in particular have when it comes to police. That tweet is no longer available on the department's account. Meanwhile, the Badgers keep moving on up in the AP Top 25 college football poll. Paul Chris' team now sits sixth in the country after the 38-zip win over Michigan State Saturday. Wisconsin's defense has pitched four shutouts so far this season in six games. They've allowed just 29 points so far this year. The Badgers hit the road this week to square off against Illinois in Wisconsin's first conference road game of the year. That's ahead of a big road test at fourth-ranked Ohio State in two weeks. That game in Columbus, by the way, announced today it will be an 11 a.m. start central time October 26th. Well, in just a few hours, the Packers will play under the Monday Night Lights at Lambeau. The team in Green Bay taking on their divisional rival, the one-loss Detroit Lions. Melissa Kim joins us with what we can expect tonight. Melissa? 
Well, hello, guys. Tonight is the 180th time that the Packers and Lions will meet. Now, the Packers have won 100 of those games, but tonight it will be for the top spot in the NFC North. Now, the Packers' defense has been a standout part of this team this season. And numbers aside, if you think about the Smith brothers, as they're known around here, Zadarius and Preston Smith, they were the off-season acquisitions, or free agent acquisitions, rather. They've been getting a lot of props about their leadership from Aaron Rodgers. I still think there's more out there for us, but, you know, I'm fortunate. We have a really good offensive staff, and all those guys contribute, and there's a lot of ideas. We've got a lot of ideas. We're not short on those. It's just about making sure we pick the right ones, um, and also, you know, we, we definitely take some input from some of the guys, you know, like, when you got a quarterback as experienced as we have, I definitely want to see what he sees on tape and what is, what he's comfortable with, you know, going into each game. That was Matt LaFleur there complimenting the offense, actually, and how much better that he thinks this offense can get. They obviously, according to him, haven't hit their ceiling yet. Aaron Rodgers, by the way, in his starts against the Lions, he's 13-5 and five against them. And coming up at 6, that is when we will hear from Aaron Rodgers about the Smith Brothers, guys. So stay tuned. All right, this is a big one tonight mm -hmm. at Lambeau Field. Back on Monday Night Football, the yep. green and gold. Melissa Kim live at Lambeau. Melissa, thank you. And still to come at 5, how Madison is celebrating Indigenous Peoples Day. Plus, after a pedestrian was killed in a crash last week, Tell you what one city leader is doing to improve pedestrian safety along a busy Madison Road. And there is much more local news ahead at 6 as an area police department looks to honor one of its own who died decades ago in the line of duty. And some Monday changes on Wall Street. The Dow falls 29 points. The Nasdaq lost 8. The S&P 500 down 4. And we'll be right back.
It is Indigenous Peoples Day in Wisconsin. Governor Tony Evers issued an executive order to rename the holiday traditionally known as Columbus Day. And in that order, the governor declared the second Monday of every October as Indigenous Peoples Day in Wisconsin to, quote, recognize and appreciate tribal nations. Now, this does not remove Columbus Day, which has been a federal holiday in the U.S. since 1934. Madison has been recognizing Indigenous Peoples Day since at least 2005, but it wasn't always consistently voted on year to year. Community members are making their concerns about pedestrian safety along East Washington known after a death on Thursday. Gabriella Becerra joins us now with what city leaders say here really needs to be changed. Gabby. District 2 Alder Patrick Heck says in order to increase pedestrian safety, the issue of the amount of drivers on the road must also be addressed. Heck says since he was elected in April, he has received at least 100 emails about traffic matters and he doesn't see those concerns slowing down any time soon, but he does identify a couple of measures that he says could be helpful. I hope that things like mass transit, bus rapid transit in particular, and additional uh, traffic calming and safety measures for bicyclists and pedestrians can alleviate some of that. Some of those concerns include crosswalk paintings, curb bump outs, and traffic enforcement. Heck says city leaders are exploring more funding for these traffic slowing measures, although he says it won't be possible in this current budget. All right, Gabby, thank you very much. President Trump's former top national security specialist on Russia testifies today in what's expected to be an important week for the House's impeachment inquiry. Fiona Hill left the administration in June, and today she gave a deposition to House committees. Hill is the first former White House official to agree to comply with House Democrats' inquiry. Later this week, lawmakers plan to question Gordon Sondland, the U.S. ambassador to the European Union. The Washington Post is reporting Sondland now plans to tell lawmakers that his denial of a quid pro quo with Ukraine was dictated to him by President Trump. Meanwhile, the president has announced his next steps against Turkish officials in retaliation for the country's military offense in northern Syria. This comes after the president ordered a pullback of U.S. forces from that region. In a statement, Trump, President Trump says that the U.S. will impose sanctions on current and former Turkish government officials, impose a 50 percent tariff on steel, and cease negotiations on a $100 billion trade deal. Today, Senator Lindsey Graham took his push for bipartisan sanctions to Fox News. There's going to be crippling sanctions imposed by the Congress to supplement what President Trump's administration has done. We're going to send a signal to Turkey that's unmistakable. Senator Graham and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi have discussed plans for a sanction bill over the phone. Nancy Pelosi fired off a series of tweets saying that Congress should also pass a joint resolution to overturn the president's decision to withdraw from Syria, in addition to passing a, quote, stronger sanction package than the White House. Police in Fort Worth, Texas have identified the white officer who shot and killed a black woman in her home over the weekend. Officials say Aaron Dean has now resigned from the force. Police have asked the FBI to look into this case, but the family of Atatiana Jefferson is outraged that Dean is not in handcuffs. This man murdered someone. He should be arrested. What would have happened if that little boy went to the window instead of his auntie? Um, um, he saw her when she fell. Police released body camera video showing Dean outside the house with a flashlight. The video shows he never identified himself as an officer before firing a shot into that window where Jefferson's eight-year-old nephew was just steps away. The scene began when a neighbor called police for a non-emergency and to request a wellness check because he knew Jefferson's mother was ill. Fort Worth police have presented the FBI a preliminary case to be reviewed for civil rights violations as well. All right, let's get a look at your first alert weather. Meteorologist Chris Reese joining us now with your complete forecast. Chris? Yeah, we're watching uh, the fall color around here just because over the past weekend we've noticed more of that starting to show up. Oddly enough, Dane County, this little green rectangle right here, is still below 25% when it comes to what? you see it just depends on what neighborhood you're on sometimes some neighborhoods are full of color others not so much but we're really seeing those leaves change across the state especially throughout the central and northern part that's where a lot of areas are in peak and given the wind we saw this weekend a lot of those leaves have been falling so 
If you are going to be raking because that time of the year is here, I'll tell you what, this afternoon and tonight is probably the best time to do it. No rain, light winds, and the ground is relatively dry. But as we move into, say, tomorrow, we're going to see showers along with gusty winds. Even on Wednesday, while the rain should come to an end, the ground will still be wet and those gusty winds will be sticking around. That's a little teaser as far as, far as what is to come. Now today, again, still plenty of sunshine out there. Those temperatures did make it up towards 50. 51. Our normal high is 60, so we were below average. 51 is still where we sit right now with a calm wind, but that little wind that does blow, it's a little chilly out there. 50 in Mineral Point right now. The Dell's also at 49, 48 as you work your way towards Viroqua. The truth is all of these temperatures are either in the 40s or 50s, which is about 9 to 10 degrees warmer than we were at this time yesterday. That's truly the difference that sunshine can do. It's not that we have a different air mass. It's just we don't have that blanket of cloud cover keeping us cooler. But as we look off towards the west, there is more cloud cover starting to stream into the picture. You notice that right at the end of the scan that is what we're watching. No rain on the leading edge of that, but as we zoom things out across the upper Midwest, this area of low pressure diving out of Canada and into Montana will be the next weather maker for us coming in under that northwesterly flow that we've had uh, really for the past couple of days. Let's go ahead and time that all out. Fun fact though, we will get just a couple degrees warmer. Pay attention to these winds coming out of the west into your Tuesday. This also draws in more moisture into our skies. And so that's what we're going to see. And then you'll see the clouds along with the chance for some showers. The cold front comes through those winds now turning in out of the north and west and we get the wraparound cloud cover and that'll likely stick with us for the next couple of days. So if you have the chance to enjoy the sunshine out there now, folks, please go ahead and do so. Overnight tonight, temperatures begin to drop. We'll fall into the upper 30s. Here comes that cloud cover in from the southwest and northwest, really just the west altogether. We'll see some spotty showers throughout the morning. I do think future track is underdone. We'll likely see a little bit more of the shower coverage than what this is showing. Temperatures will warm up into the low 50s for those highs. We'll see the cloud cover and spotty showers likely taking us all the way into at least early on on Wednesday as well. I think Maybe by Wednesday night into Thursday, the clouds start to break up and we see just a little bit more in the way of some sunshine. But there is good news. After this push of colder air that we have on Wednesday, I think there's a sign of some warmer temperatures that start to move in, especially as we move towards the weekend. So that will be something to watch. Temperatures near 60 on Friday with sunshine. We'll stay in the 60s throughout Saturday and Sunday. The only problem there is we'll have rain chances through Monday and then perhaps another round of some extended cloud cover as we move into next week. We're watching the first alert traffic for you guys as well. This is the Beltline at Park Street. Uh, no major issues showing up, but of course we are seeing those typical evening commute slowdowns, perhaps as slow as 14 miles per hour in some cases. Downtown, we're seeing some heavy traffic delays, especially on East Wash as you begin to head uh, northeast towards Sun Prairie, but make sure that you are just packing your patience, driving safely, and so we can all see you back here tomorrow, guys. All right, Chris, thank you. And still to come on News Now at 5, how a California group is helping everyone have a chance to go for a bike ride, even if they can't see. That's just ahead. News
A unique group in California is bringing the joys of cycling to the blind and visually impaired. CBS's Nichelle Medina shows us how it is transforming lives through tandem biking. Okay, Stokey, you ready? Yes, sir, let's do this. Rocky Camp is ready to ride. I'm living again. Despite having a condition that robbed him of his sight. Retinitis pigmentosa. A veterinarian and triathlete, the 65-year-old struggled with a diagnosis. Feeling isolated, dependent, fearful. His condition took a toll not just emotionally. I was definitely getting weaker, and I didn't have the endurance that I used to have, and it came back very quickly. He credits this man. Together, Rocky and Dave White have pedaled their way across Southern California. In 2007, Dave started the Blind Stokers Club. A captain with vision is paired with a blind partner called a stoker. We will take and support a stoker who wants to, to ride recreationally once or twice a month, and all the way to someone who uh, wants to compete. Research shows people with vision loss are more likely to suffer from depression. Psychologists say cycling can improve mood and relieve anxiety and stress. I love just looking and, and seeing the smile and the expressions when, when we go different places or go downhill or feel a, a breeze come across us. I feel normal. Rocky's enjoying experiences he thought were lost forever. There's a chance my kids may get this. It's a genetic disease, and I want to be a good example for them that life will go on. He says it's all part of the journey. Nichelle Medina, CBS News, Solana Beach, California. What a great program there. The club has 140 active members and rolls along thanks to grants and donations. For more information, you can visit blindstokersclub.com. And stay with us. Chris will have another final check. Your forecast when we return.
Tonight on the CBS Evening News, we've got new information on the escalating military and humanitarian crisis in Syria, what it means for U.S. troops in the region. The parents of a British teenager killed by the wife of an American diplomat are speaking to CBS News about their search for justice. And three female athletes made history over the weekend, setting new records, will share their inspiring stories. We've got all that tonight and more on the CBS Evening News. We were talking about how the sunshine is a little deceiving today. Yeah, <laughs> it's so a little chilly out there. Unfortunately, I think the sun's going to go away tonight and tomorrow, at least temporarily. The sun always comes back out eventually. 38 degrees tonight. We become mostly cloudy. We might see some showers developing. That leads us into your Tuesday, which I do think is going to be a fairly damp day. We'll see some showers around in the morning, perhaps again in the afternoon. Those temperatures top out around 53. More chances of rain, though, as we move into the weekend. Saturday, Sunday, Monday next week do look like we could see off and on showers. It doesn't look like a washout, but still off and on showers and then cooler with more cloud cover by next Wednesday and Thursday. All right. Well, at least we get a little bit warmer yeah. as we get yeah. later in the week. It is a little warmer. That hit like a ton of bricks uh, when it really got cold over the weekend. Yeah. You can no, feel there was, that. There was no medium. We went from summer to winter. <laughs> That's how it always is. Yeah, really. All right. We're back with more updates in 30 minutes for News for Now. Stay tuned now for the CBS Evening News.